Hello and welcome again to the live streaming of Breaking Into Yacht Brokerage. Um, I see Patrick is already here, Patrick Abbas. <laughs> Good to see you, Patrick. Um, I'm going to say this undoubtedly many times during this live stream. I do apologise for the state of my nose. I had an operation this week on my nose um, and uh, nothing serious, just the consequence of uh, having very delicate English skin and being out under the sun all the time. Uh, so um, no doubt I'll, I'll be saying that many times during the course of this live stream, which is the very last live stream of the course of breaking into yacht brokerage. Let me just adjust the camera. That looks a little bit better. Um, so before we get started on the on the last of this series, there will be more live streams to come in the in the future. Uh, let me just very quickly recap a few of the sort of simple housekeeping uh, rules that we've discussed in previous um, live streams. First of all, the actual presentation will be 10 to 15 minutes. It may be a little bit longer this time because there's quite a lot to get through. Um, followed by which I'm open to all of your questions. Uh, I'll be very, very happy to answer them. Questions accompanied by a super chat will always get priority and I'll do my best to give the most thorough Answerably can, and also of course questions that are relevant to uh, to what we're talking about will be given uh, some level of priority too. Uh, just before I get started, I once again say apologies for the state of my nose. It was due to an operation I had earlier this week. So let's get let's get started. In previous uh, live stream videos, we've spoken about if you want to break into the yachting industry you have to get somewhere where there are yachts and we gave in the first series the first episode let's say we gave a lot of practical advice as to how you can move to an area where there's yachts without spending an excessive amount of money um, and then at the end of that uh, particular episode we said that you should really take a good look at yourself and, and consider what sort of person you are. Are you a complete starter? Have you just finished in university? Are you somebody who's been working for quite some time, but you're just a little dissatisfied, so you're a dissatisfied worker? Or are you actually very happy with your job, but you're very ambitious and you want to do more? And uh, we called that the, the career builder. And in each of the following three videos that we did, we looked at each one of those scenarios to give you some good advice as to how you could break into brokerage according to your circumstances. Um, but all of those three scenarios had one common theme, and that's that what yacht brokerages are looking for is not somebody with a degree. Uh, it's not somebody who can talk the hind legs off of a donkey, as we say uh, in the UK. But they're looking really for four, um, four things. They're looking for somebody with relevant connections, they're looking for somebody with some knowledge of yachts in the yachting industry, a proven ability to network, and successful experience in sales. And basically all of those previous videos that we did were showing how in each one of those three scenarios you can build those four factors so that you have a better chance of getting a job with a yacht brokerage company. And this week we're going to look at the most interesting question of all, which is of course how much money can you make as a yacht broker? I think Probably the two factors that attract people the most to becoming a yacht broker are the lifestyle and the money. Those are the two reasons most people want to become a yacht broker. Once you have got into the yachting industry, the lifestyle, let me tell you, is very easy to, to get into. There are lots of parties, gala dinners, events, invitations to shipyards, who then take you out for big dinners, plenty of opportunities to go out for dinner with clients, opportunities to be invited on yachts. The lifestyle is not a problem, I can tell you that. The lifestyle is very, very easy to get used to. The difficulty is making the money. That is the real challenge of being a yacht broker. It's absolutely not as easy uh, as it may sound. And so I'm not gonna waste any time telling you about the lifestyle side of it. Let's get into how much commission uh, you can make as a yacht broker. And I'm gonna start with very, very simple and clear facts. And in the description below this video, you'll see all this written down too. First of all, it's worth saying that 
the most successful yacht brokers in the industry are very, very wealthy people. Um, I even know a, a few, albeit a handful, um, that even own their own yachts, although that's the exception to the rule. Um, so they, the potential to make money is certainly there. But as we'll see during this part of the course, the reality is that it's not that easy at all. But let's start with those figures. Standard commission on the first $10 million of a yacht is 10%. The second 10 million is 5%. And then every 10 million increment after that is 2.5%. So what that means in reality is if the yacht that you're selling is less than 10 million, you can make... Ten percent of the first ten million, five percent of the second, two and a half percent of everyone after that. So what that means in practical terms is that um, a thirty million dollar yacht, you could potentially be paid a million dollars for the first ten million of the yacht's price, five hundred thousand for the second, and two hundred fifty thousand for the third. So the potential commission on a $30 million yacht is $1.75 million. Now that sounds absolutely fantastic. I and mean, we would all love to sell a $30 million yacht a week, or as uh, the owner of Northrop and Johnson would say, why, why limit yourself to a week, so one a day? Um, but in, in reality, it doesn't work out quite that way. Um, and I really want to set your expectations to a reasonable and realistic level and not to make promises of something that's completely unachie unachievable. Um, so let's look at what you could expect to make realistically as a yacht broker. And if you're new to the industry and you're just breaking in to the yacht brokerage industry, most likely you'd start off as a junior broker. Um, and that means that what most large brokerage companies do is they offer you a small wage usually just about enough to, to live on, and a percentage of the commission that the brokerage company makes. I mean, they give you a little bit more than that too. They give you some office space, they'll give you business cards, access to boat shows. Most likely you'll get a, an assistant, although the assistant is usually shared between other brokers as well. If you're a junior, you have to kind of fight for their attention. So they give you some level of support, but they give you a percentage of the commission that's made. Um, I don't really want to give uh, any set figures because it varies so much from one brokerage to another. It varies on what you're bringing to the table. It varies on the country that you're living in. But let's say 10, 20 percent of the commission may go to a junior broker. And as you can imagine, the, um, the higher the wage that you're offered, the lower the percentage of commission that you'll get. The higher the percentage of commission that you want, the lower wage and, and brokers such as myself and, and most other senior brokers are on a commission only basis. So then you might think, well, OK, I've sold a 30 million dollar yacht. Um, we said that the commission on that was one point seven five million dollars. Twenty percent of that is still three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's not bad. I can still make a lot of money. Well, I'm here to tell you that it's not even as simple as that because there are two other factors to take into account that will influence the money that you make uh, as a yacht broker. Before I go on, um, I see that we've had quite a few people join us. So once again, just to explain, I apologize for my nose. I had an operation this week, um, which was basically just uh, due to the amount of sun that my skin gets exposed to. And rather than call off the live stream, I thought I'd just go ahead with this bandage on my nose. So uh, thanks for your understanding with that. Now let's uh, let's get back to the um, let's get back to the, the theme of how much uh, commission you can make. We just said that twenty. If you're a junior broker, you may get twenty percent of the commission. And I've said to you that it may not even be as simple as that. There's two other factors that will affect your commission. The first of those two factors is the negotiation. Um, nothing is ever as simple as it seems. So let's take, for example, that $30 million yacht. Um, it's highly unlikely that somebody will come along and pay $30 million for it. There's always a negotiation. So first of all, the actual purchase price 
has to be negotiated. And then a, a client once said to me that most deals are done when the seller receives a little bit less than he really wanted and the buyer has to pay a little bit more than they really wanted. Everybody goes away disappointed in the end. And if you're a good broker, uh, you need to be flexible as well on your expectations. On commission, you may have to take a little bit of pain too to make the deal happen. It's a horrible thing when the greed of a broker stops a yacht from getting sold. Having said that, I must say, never undersell yourself. Never devalue the service that you're offering. Because to find somebody on planet Earth that's willing to buy a $30 million yacht with, in a market that's full of $30 million yachts, it's quite an achievement. It's not as easy as it may seem. And actually the buyer, who for sure is a very wealthy person, they know themselves if it was that easy, they would have done it themselves um, and they wouldn't need a broker. So never, never, never undersell yourself and never, to use the expression, never drop your pants to make a, a sale happen. But you may have to be a little bit flexible in your expectations. So that's the first thing that will affect your commission. Um, Let's, let's put some numbers on that. And again, these numbers are in the description below. We've said that um, the yacht's worth, or well, the yacht's asking $30 million. Let's say they accept 25 million, um, which would be a commission of 1.625. And I worked that out before, obviously. I haven't just done that in my head right now. $1.625 million would be the commission, which would give the seller a net of 23 million 375,000. Now the, the seller might say to you, you know what, I am absolute, I wanted 25 million net. You're now making me take 25 million gross. I'll go to 24 million net, but no lower than that. And you may have to make a judgment call and say, well, you know what, a million dollars is still not a bad commission to make uh, on the yacht. So now your commission's gone down from a potential one and three quarters to just one, which you accept to make the deal happen. And you think to yourself, well, you know, 20% of the million is still 200,000. Got bad news, it doesn't end there because the second factor that you need to take into account is that most yachts are sold with one broker representing the buyer, another the broker representing the seller. Um, so in this scenario, let's say that you're representing the seller and a broker from Burgess or Edmiston or Camper Nicholson's has brought along the buyer to you. Usually, but not always, but usually, there's a 60-40 split in favour of the buying broker. And that's because the buyer's broker does kind of have a little more leverage than the seller's broker. If you're the seller's broker, you've got that yacht to sell. That's what you've got. If you're the buyer's broker, you can pretty easily redirect your buyer to another yacht. So you do have a little bit more leverage and to motivate the buyer, uh, the buyer's broker, they get a little bit more of the pot. So going back to numbers, you've now reduced your commission to a million. And that million, your brokerage house now gets 400,000. And remember, you're getting a 20% split. So your commission actually will be $80,000 um, from that sale. So the reason I'm telling you all of this is because from the outside looking in at yacht brokerage, you might say they've sold a $30 million yacht. They've just made $3 million because I've heard that brokers get 10%. Well, in reality, it's not 10% of a figure as high as that. It would be more like $1.75 million. Then you normally have to negotiate to some degree. $30 million, uh, the offer that's actually been made on the yacht will probably be less than that. You have to give a little bit on your commission. A chunk of commission has to go to the buyer's broker. But remember, if you're a junior broker, you're still getting a small wage. So to make an $80,000 bonus is, is still pretty good. You can still live a pretty good life uh, uh, you know, with that kind of money coming in. Obviously, as you progress um, in your career, you would eventually want to get on to be a position as a senior broker where you get no wage at all, but a senior broker usually would expect a 50-50 split um, with the brokerage house. So then of that 400,000 commission, you know, you can walk away with a couple of hundred thousand and you know, that's, that starts to get a more interesting income to be coming in 
uh, during the year. It is, and this is something I really want to convey to people who are listening to this course because they really want to be a yacht broker. It is a high risk, high reward industry. And whilst at the beginning I said that there are some yacht brokers, although not many, who even own their own yachts, they are very, very, very few and far between. And believe me, because I've worked with some of them, they work as hard as anybody that I know and have uh, built up over years an incredible skill set. And above all, and this is something we'll maybe talk about in more in detail in future live streams, um, their ability to build relationships with people is really quite, quite exceptional. So, you know, for most yacht brokers, it's a job like any other in the sense that they're paying a mortgage, they've still got to think about their their, their bills that they have to pay. Uh, it's very, very high stress and it's somewhat of a roller coaster. You know, you, you sell a yacht and you've got money in the bank and then you can go a long period without and suddenly uh, you, know, you start to worry about where the next sale is coming from. But nonetheless, the potential for good earnings is certainly there. The final thing I want to say before I wind up on this part of the live stream is don't underestimate the value of working for a large brokerage company. Um, all the way through this week's live stream, you may have been thinking to yourself, well, why should I share the commission with a brokerage house? Why wouldn't I just work for myself and take all of the commission? And actually, if you've got a network of buyers, I would say that's not a bad strategy at all, if you have buyers. However, if you work predominantly with sellers, it's very difficult to work with that, a large yacht brokerage company. You know, I've, I've always worked for a brokerage. I worked for Camper Nicholson's and then for Northrop and Johnson and before them for a, for a smaller yacht brokerage company too. And what they give you in terms of credibility, um, exposure online, their website, their legal experience, the network and, and, and advice that you can get from other uh from other yacht brokers, not to mention access to the really large yacht shows, which are very, very expensive to be in. It's absolutely invaluable. Um, and my sincere advice would be, if you seriously want to become a yacht broker, to try to get in with one of those large yacht brokerage companies. Um, so that pretty much winds up uh, the Breaking Into Brokerage live stream course. I hope you've enjoyed it. We're gonna go into your questions in a few seconds. Um, I'm not going to stop the live streams. I'm going to carry on every Friday evening. Uh, I probably will call it Broker Talk or something like that. Um, and we'll just talk about other themes uh, and I'll think about the theme for next week. Oh, thanks. We've already got a, a, a super chat, which I'm very, very grateful for. Rudy Degelt. How are you, Rudy? Thank you very much for the super chat. Hello, David. Many people on the live are worried about your injury. We hope there's nothing serious health before all. Thank you very much, Rudy. I appreciate that. And I, I realised when I started, I was going to have to give an explanation for my nose. Um, it's nothing serious at all. It's um, I just had to have a small operation as a result of spending so much time into the sun. I have very delicate English skin. And um, this was something that's needed to be done for a, a long while. And unfortunately, it was put off due to the lockdown. All the hospitals in my area were just completely consumed with the uh, COVID uh, problem, but then this week I was finally able to get in and have this have this done to my nose. And uh, let me tell you, it was much more horrible than I thought it would be. And uh, it's going. That's right. Somebody's just written actually basal cell carcinoma. And you're absolutely right. That's absolutely exactly what uh, what it is. So I'm going to end up with this on my nose for two to three weeks. And I thought I can't stop the video production. As a matter of fact, tomorrow I've got a vlog that I'm very excited about, uh, which I'll be publishing, I hope, in the morning. And you'll see me in the vlog with this, with this nose. It is what it is. Let's have a look. Um, second star to the right, smashing course. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you enjoyed it. And I haven't heard the word smash, smashing in a lot, in a long time. So that's, uh, that's nice to hear. Um, <laughs> Pooh keeps, he says, what does your opponent look like? Well, actually, my opponent was the uh, was the surgeon and he just had a very smug grin as I handed over my cash to him. Um, everybody's asking, what did happen to your nose? I've answered that now and um, I dare say I'll answer it again. Um, 
Oh, we just had another live chat. I could, here we go. Thank you very much, David. David Dillon, thank you very much, David. I really appreciate that. Um, hello, David. How many sales are done in the office? And how many times does a client fly you somewhere? And do they fly you privately or commercially for the most part, of course? That's a very interesting question. Um, if you mean actually physically a sale done in the office, um, I would say that the, the signing of the contract is done from time to time in the office. Um, I used to work regularly in our office in Antibes. And if you know, we'd shown a yacht that was in the port of Antibes and our office was right there and it was going well and we were able to get the seller on the telephone and, and get everything um, agreed to over the phone, then I've taken clients back to the office in Antibes before and actually signed the contract there in the office. However, it's unusual. Um, most things are done by email and um, or on the yacht itself. I've, you know, I've had contracts signed on the yacht itself. There's something very, very exciting about signing the yacht and signing the contract on the yacht that you're selling. It's a really good feeling about that. Um, and with regard to does the client fly you somewhere and do they fly you privately or commercially? Um, a lot depends upon the relationship with the with the client themselves. I've had clients who we've gone shopping for yachts and the shopping has lasted more than a year. And over the course of that year, um, the relationship with the client has grown and grown and grown and grown. And um, at a certain point, the client has said to me, uh, why don't you do us? And we've flown privately to go and look at the yachts and as you can imagine that's just the uh, most wonderful experience for a yacht broker to fly privately with your clients and i know of a lot of yacht brokers who regularly take private flights with their clients because they have that level of relationship however what's more normal is that you fly in and the client flies in and you meet on the yacht and um you know the more wise and experienced yacht brokers uh will fly economy because this is an expensive business to be in and and you know i've learned over the years uh to pay for a, a hotel that is not embarrassingly bad but is not ridiculously expensive either um and i learned that and i'll you know, since it was a super chat and i've said that super chats i'll give the most thorough answer that i possibly can um, I think I've mentioned before that the, the first yacht I ever sold was an absolute whopper. It was one of the largest yachts in the world um, at the time. It still is in the top 100. And I had to sign, sign a non-disclosure agreement. So unfortunately, I can't give you any more details than that. Um, but when I got the commission, uh, I was a lunatic. I, I wasn't a complete lunatic. I paid the mortgage on my house and um, and I bought my dream car that I'd always wanted. And I started staying in some ridiculously expensive hotels, flying over everywhere, because I I'd got that first sale I thought was going to happen every year. And of course, it didn't. Um, and so you learn with experience that that's a really dumb thing to do and that you should treat this as a business like any other and be very, very wise with the money that you have and treat every every commission you get. You should treat as if it's going to be your last because you never know it might be. So thanks for the question. Thanks for the super chat. I'm going to um, scroll down, see what other questions we have. Uh, uh, more questions about my nose. Uh, this is a good question from Svetlin Kar 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 I'm so sorry, Karadzov. Very, very good question. Um, Greetings, David. When on the seller side of brokerage, to what extent do you influence the initial listing price? That's such a good question because obviously the seller wants to know what you think you should uh, list the boat for. And um, you have to, if you're going to do this business seriously, you have to give them realistic expectations. You just have to. Um, and very often you'll lose the listing as a result of that. Because what happens is that a lot of the competition will go in and give an unrealistic expectation. And then the seller 
assumes that that broker will get more money simply because he says that you should list the yacht at a higher price. And it's a horrible part of this industry. Um, it, I'll, I'll just give you a, a quick story on that, which is that um, I was one of the most exciting pitches I ever went to was at Monaco Yacht Club. And I was invited uh, to pitch for a very, very important yacht, um, along with four other brokers. And we were literally all waiting to, to go in and we were all given half an hour each um, on the pitch. And I, my USP, of course, is my YouTube channel. No other broker's got anything quite like it. Um, and especially at the time that I did this pitch, and I wanted to show the owner of the yacht the first couple of minutes of one of my videos. And he loved the video so much, he made me show him the entire video. And I thought, I've got it, I've got the business. This is fantastic, nobody else can offer this. And at the end of the pitch, he said, how much do you think my yacht, I should ask uh, for the yacht? He said, I wanna sell the yacht within the next three months. And I said, well, if you wanna sell it in the next three months, uh, the asking price is gonna be absolutely crucial. And in my opinion, um, yeah, and I can tell you what the figures were because it's not a. I'm not telling you what the yacht was. Um, in my opinion, you should. Um, I think I said to him, you should ask thirty. Any offer over twenty five, we should take very seriously. And if you can close at twenty seven, I think that's where you'll get if you really want to sell it in the next three months. The owner's face dropped. The other brokers had told him to ask thirty five, and he's likely to get thirty three for the yacht. And I said to him, you know, in all good conscience. I can't go with that. But look, if you want my marketing, but you believe their advice, take my marketing, we'll ask 35, but I'm telling you now, you're not gonna get over 30 if you want to sell it in the next three months. Long story short, he gave the listing to somebody else and they had it for sale for two years. Um, they eventually asked 27, lost the listing. And I do know that the yacht was sold for considerably less than that. So yeah, good question. Um, you, you, we have some influence, but often sellers don't want to hear the truth. Uh, again, it comes down to your relationship with the with the client. Uh, if you have a long term relationship, the client comes to trust you and to trust your your advice. Um, let me work our way through the um, through the questions. If I do miss a super chat because I'm technically a bit ignorant, please do let me know with your comments, and I'll make sure I get to it. Um, Jerry Boyar says, can you draw a parallel of being a yacht broker to being a real estate broker? Absolutely, there are many, many similarities. The use of multiple listing systems is very, very similar. The techniques, the importance of um, being able to close, the importance of knowing the contract, the importance of knowing the, the relevant laws. Uh, there's, there's some massive similarities. Uh, in fact, I often think in, a, in a, um, an alternative universe, I may have been a a real estate agent rather than a than a yacht broker. We've had another super chat, so thank you very much indeed for that. David Dillon, um, what's done to pre-screen a buying client? And if I ask you to represent me, be forewarned, I'm dreaming. <laughs> thank you for your honesty. And I've got to say, David, I, I love the emails that I get from time to time from viewers of the channel who um, straight away say to me, I can't afford to buy a yacht, but how much does this cost? But uh, uh, And as far as I possibly can, as time permits, I always try to answer those emails. Um, the ones that I often don't answer or um, are a little bit more abrupt with are the ones who are clearly trying to take them for a ride because they pretend to be able to own. Um, to pre-screen a buying client, what I do, first of all, I Google them uh, because you can very quickly tell if somebody's wealthy. You know, if I see that they're the CEO of a notable company, uh, if I see they're an entrepreneur, uh, sometimes you can see, especially with uh, US clients, um, sometimes they'll make big donations to some humanitarian cause. Uh, there, there's something that's very big in the yachting community in Florida called the Boys and Girls Club. And it's um, where yacht owners donate money to um, good causes for children. There's lots of things on Google that immediately let you know that this is a credible person. Having said that, I do have clients who you just can't find on Google. And yet I know that they're very, very wealthy people because I've bought and sold yachts with them. So I don't immediately assume that they're not just because I can't find them on Google. 
So if I can't find them on Google, I'm very upfront about it. And I'll, I'll try to be as polite as I can. And I'll say, you'll have to excuse me, but you know, I, during due diligence, I was unable to find out anything about you. Um, are you able, please, before we go any further, to give me some sort of a, a proof of funds or proof of wealth? Now, genuinely wealthy people, David, won't get offended by that because every time they buy a private jet, every time they buy another company, every time they buy another villa, they're asked exactly the same question. It's called due diligence. It's also called KYC, know your clients. And any lawyer and any real estate agent and any yacht broker and any private jet seller has to know who their client is and has to ask those questions. So what I've found is that the genuine people get back to me very quickly because they're quite used to being asked that question and they've immediately got something to send to me. Um, but the frauds get very, very offended. I had one guy say to me, you know, how dare you? I could buy this yacht 20 times over if I wanted to. I'll go and find another yacht broker. I'll go and find another yacht broker then, you know. Uh, they're, if they're a serious yacht broker, they're only going to ask you the same question. So that's what's um, done to pre-screen a buying client. There's also another side to that, by the way, which is particularly sensitive in um, areas such as Monaco, but also the UK. And that's the anti-money laundering um, rules. We're not able to take the money of people or do business with people who we don't know who they are. And so there's um, a website called World Check that uh, Northrop and Johnson, we use, will put their name into World Check. And if they come out as you know FBI most wanted or, or terrorists, we just can't do business with them. And I know a broker who walked away from a multi, multi, multi-million dollar commission simply because the the potential buyer was a, a well-known uh, scallywag on the international level. And it was just clearly money laundering. And uh, you know, very admirably, he walked away from that deal because you just can't get involved with that kind of that kind of business. There are also companies that um, have services. As a matter of fact, last week I was talking to a company who does exactly that service of um, verifying and pre-screening clients. So yeah, there's a fair old pre-screening process that's gone through. Owes Khan, oh man, what happened to your nose? What happened to you, Owes? Have you already just arrived here? <laughs> no, I had, um, I had to have a small operation on my nose. Um, so, and thank you very much for saying, I hope you will be better and for the love hearts and the, all the emojis. It was just an operation. It's going to be like this, I'm afraid, for uh, two to three weeks, although I'm hoping that the bandage is replaced with something a little smaller, a little bit more discreet. Patrick, good to hear from you, Patrick. Are both parties on site during the viewing and initial talks? Absolutely not. Um, asking because of the emotion involved of the seller. This can be disturbing. How do you deal with this? Um, I do everything I can to make sure that both parties are not on the yacht at the same time, because with all the best will in the world, it's just too easy for the seller to go right to the buyer. And before you know it, they've done a deal, they've shaken hands and you've been cut out of the equation. Now, it's true that there's a central agency agreement that guarantees you a full commission. Um, so you can always go to the seller and buyer and say, listen, guys, forget this. Um, I have a contract here. But that's not a situation that anybody wants to happen. You don't want to have to threaten legal action. Um, it's just far better if everybody lets the other person do their job. Um, the seller should not be on the boat when the buyer is there. Sometimes it can't be helped. And I've had that situation happen. You just have to deal with it the best that you possibly can. Um, and as far as you can, you want to avoid that happen. Another super chat. Thank you very much, Michael Berger. Um, oh, this is a good question. What's the pay structure for a charter broker? It's very good to tell you the truth. It's very, very good. Charter brokers get paid very well. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make a note and we're going to make a live stream of that. And what I'll do is I'll invite a charter broker to the live stream and we'll have a proper in-depth discussion on that because much like the conversation we've had today there's far more to it than meets the eye so um thanks very much for the super chat i can tell you that it's um it's around about the 15 percent mark 15 to 20 percent depending upon how the deal's structured um but charter brokers usually 
have a decent wage and their commission split with the brokerage company is a little bit less because I've never been a charter broker. I've never gone into that much detail asking charter brokers how much they make. Also, because it's one of those questions that you, know, you don't really want to, to ask of a colleague. Uh, David, thank you. Another, another super chat, David. I appreciate all these super chats. Regarding Patrick's question, what about the selling party's crew? Are they usually on board? They're always on board. And uh, they are tremendously important during the selling process. I just can't emphasize that enough. And in fact, as a broker, your relationship with the captain and the crew is as important as your relationship with the owner of the yacht. Um, you need a crew that know when to talk and know when to shut up, and they don't always. Um, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, what can sometimes... You, you, there, there's all kinds of chemistry going on during the, the showing. Um, and so it's, it's wise to go ahead of time, and I should really take my own advice on this. So, you know, listen to what I say, don't look at what I always do, but the, the best brokers go on board and prep the crew, and what I personally like is for the captain to tag along with us for if there's any questions asked, um, because it always sounds better coming from the captain. Captains don't have a dog in the fight. They're not commission driven. Generally speaking, captains are very, very honest with their answers. And I think for the buyer, it's a good, um, it's a good indication that I'm happy for him to talk to the captain. And I'll often say in front of the buyer, um, to the captain, tell the truth, don't hold anything back. If there's something broken, tell us, we need to know. If there's something you don't like on the lot, yacht, tell us, we need to know, don't hold anything back. The danger is when the captain then thinks that they are the salesman and they take over the visit and they're trying to, and, and the, the whole key to this business is everybody staying in their lane. Uh, the captain is tremendously important through the entire uh, sales process, but it's the broker who needs to drive the sale and do the negotiation and the, the the commercial tactics. So really, really good question. I hope that was a sufficiently thorough answer. Hey, Super Yacht Captain. Tristan, how are you? Good to hear from you. Hey, David Montana. There's obviously a joke in that that I don't get. How are you doing? Has Hannah Montana broken her nose or something? I don't know. But anyway, good to hear from you, Tristan. Just one moment, because I know you get upset by this. Tristan's mug. A little bit of free advertising there for you, Tristan. I don't know where I could... Actually, it was more visible before, wasn't it? Let me just put it back. Um, we've got greetings from Seattle Lake in Washington. Tom says, love your videos. Thanks, Tom. That kind of thing gives me a buzz. Thanks. Uh, David Dillon says hi to Tristan. He's actually left your chat to come over here. So thanks very much, David. <laughs> much appreciated. Tom says, is 150 yacht the ideal yacht size? If money were no object for me, and let me tell you, money is an object often for me. Um, I, uh, for me personally, 150 yacht, 150 foot yacht is absolutely the sweet spot because you can get in and out of most marinas. You can have a good size tender. The staterooms are usually palatial and beautiful on a 150 foot yacht. And you also have sufficiently large staterooms for your guests on board to be very happy as well. Um, for me, it's the sweet spot um, personally, but obviously it's a question of, of taste. Grandpa Geek, I like your name, Grandpa Geek. Other than price, why do yachts why do some yachts sit on the market for years? Do sellers have recourse against the broker? Sellers don't have legal recourse against the broker. Um, if a, a seller's not happy with the broker, they should just fire them. Um, in a central agency agreement, the broker commits to doing certain things. Um, they should, in a good central agency agreement. Um, is a contract which will normally be a renewable contract year in year and um, the broker will commit to a certain amount of advertising online and often in print although honestly in my opinion print advertising has zero value anymore um, 
they uh, they should commit to reporting back to the seller as to what they're doing and, and how things are going. Uh, so if you're not happy with your broker, you don't have legal recourse, but just get rid of him and get a new broker uh, to take his place. But unfortunately, you will have lost a year uh, in that time. So why don't the, the, the actual question was, why don't why is some yachts on the market for so long? And, you know, the honest truth, Grandpa Geek, is that um, the sometimes the uh, demand is lower than the supply. There's often an excess of yachts on the market um, and the demand is not that great. Uh, so, you know, usually, certainly in recent years, usually if you've got a, say, a $5 million budget, you have such an abundance of yachts that you can look out for of all different types and conditions. Um, so I think that's probably the reason. There are, and I have to say it, there are some great brokers out there and there are some truly lousy and lazy brokers as well. And a little bit, it's because of the what we've been talking about in this live stream, which is that a yacht broker can make a tremendous amount of money. And, um, you know, if they've just sold a large yacht and they've made two, three, four hundred thousand euro, sometimes a broker will disappear for the next three months while they're just partying it up. And it's, uh, you know, I've said this on previous live streams, it's a, it's a great fun business, but it's a lousy business as well for many respects that really needs more regulation and a bit of shaking up. Unfortunately, I'm not the person to, to shake it up, but um, it, it does need a good looking at. So, you know, sometimes it is the broker, sometimes it's the price, more often than not it's the price. Sometimes it's because there's such demand on the, there's such a supply on the, on the, on the market. Another, another super chat, thank you very much. <laughs> Rudy says, my question will be on normal chat too long. I'm going to look out for it then, Rudy. Um, but first I answer somebody else's question. Uh, not to be rude. David Dillon says, not to be rude, but did you skip my last super chat? David, put the put the question in the normal chat just in case. I've, let me just take a look if I can operate this thing. Yeah, put put your question that I missed in the normal chat, and I'll um, and I'll I'll definitely answer it. Uh, oh, Thomas Canning said David Dillon. He didn't skip it. He talked about it about five minutes ago. So you'll be able to get it in the in the recording you see this video is left on my youtube channel you'll be able to to pick it up then um there was another really good question here i've just lost it for a second has your channel helped other brokers in your firm Ten tony jenkins says um, yes, actually, uh, it's uh, I work very closely with another broker called Ed Dickinson. In fact, if you've seen a lot of my walkthrough videos, uh, more often than not, Ed is the co-broker with me. And so he's found the videos very helpful. The big 72 meter um, yacht solo, which I did a, a video of as well uh, in the Caribbean, Part of the pitch that enabled us to get that yacht for sale was that one of my videos on my channel uh, would be you know, provided by the company. So, yeah, it's becoming more and more useful for the company and more and more useful for fellow brokers. We have another, another super chat. Here we go. <laughs> Camilo Di Gasperi. How often do you whitewash walls in your office or is it a video filter? Did you beat the other guy? Camilo, good question. Both two questions actually for the price of one. Uh, did I beat the other guy? No, it was an operation uh, on my nose and unfortunately um, it's gonna look this way for a couple of weeks, sadly, but uh, I have to go ahead with the videos. So I'm just videoing myself with, uh, with the bandage. The, the story of the walls in my office, you can see them green right now and that's because in the very early days and I'm talking years ago um, the very early days of my of my YouTube story I was experimenting with green screen technology which is where you video yourself with a green background and you can superimpose 
images of yachts. In fact, if you go back to the very, very first videos that I'd ever did, which were awful, a lot of that was with the green screen. So these walls have been green for absolutely ages. And then this year, around about Christmas, I was going to paint them the color of my logo um, at Christmas, and I just didn't get around to it. So in post-production, my editors will often color, I don't know what they call it, color grade it, um, so it looks a different color to what it actually is. That is the story of the colors of my walls. Bonus content on this live stream. Working my way down, um, Rudy, Rudy says, was this your, okay, yeah, this is your super chat question that's in the normal chat, Rudy. The major yachting industries demand that the Monaco Yacht Show be cancelled, 60% of the show. This has a negative impact on brokerage. How do you react? What is the impact on sales? Rudy, I have a very um, clear opinion on that, which I'm not um, afraid to uh, to openly discuss. Yeah, the, the um, Monaco Yacht Show is owned and run by a company, the name of which absolutely escapes me. I was talking about it earlier. Today. Anyway, it's a huge company, events company. Obviously, they want it to go ahead. Of course, they want it to go ahead. Can you imagine being a huge events company with the coronavirus going on? This year must be a disaster for them. And at all costs, they want the show to, to go ahead. Totally understandable. They haven't made themselves great friends of the yachting industry, to be perfectly honest, because they charge exorbitant amounts. And I think uh, I, I'm not at that level in the yachting industry where I talk to these people or I have anything to do with the organisation of the show. I'm absolutely not. I'm just a broker that turns up and does my job. And I love the Monaco Yacht Show. However, I do hear the feedback that it's incredibly expensive and that the company that run the show have never been particularly sympathetic to the comments of the brokerage industry and the yacht building industry. Now, the yacht building industry has an organization called CBAS, of which the large builders are a part. And the brokerage industry has a, an organization called Libra, which is Large Yacht Brokerage Association. Uh, of which Northrop and Johnson, Camper and Nicholson's, um, Fraser's, uh, Burgess, the big brokerage companies, are a part of. Now, CBAS and Libra have come together and said, there's no point having the show this year. People just aren't going to go to it. Um, we don't know if travel restrictions will be lifted. We don't know if people will have the appetite to be in large crowds um, by the time that year comes at that time of the year comes. So they've all pulled out of the Monaco Yacht Show. Um, it was announced this week. Um, but I, to my knowledge, Monaco still, or the organisers would still like the show to go ahead. Honestly, um, for me, Rudy, um, it makes no difference. Monaco is a lot of fun. It's great for networking. It's great for catching up with your clients, but it's also very, very expensive. For me as well, um, it's very expensive because I have to pay for my hotel room. Um, it's incredibly expensive to stay in Monaco during the show. As you can imagine, hotel prices go through the roof. So for me, I was about to say it's no skin off of my nose. That's the best expression that I can think to use. If we don't have it this year, it'll make no difference to my business whatsoever. The only thing is that I won't um, meet up with some clients that I regularly meet up with. I'll call them. We'll meet somewhere else. Um, it's not... It's not a big deal for me, it, it really isn't. Hope that answers your question. We have another super chat and it's a big one, although I don't know what ZAR are. <laughs> but thank you very much, Stevens Ottero, um, 50 ZAR. Hi David, when will we see a collaboration between you and Nick from Aquaholic? Me and Nick from Aquaholic talk regularly about exactly that subject. And we have some ideas that could be very funny and very, uh, very good, uh, very good, fun, productive ideas uh, that we have. The problem that we have is we're never or hardly ever together in the same place at the same time. Uh, Nick lives in the UK. Um, I spend most of my time in Italy, although I travel uh, an awful lot outside of Italy. 
We almost managed to do a collaboration last year at the Can Boat Show. We just couldn't quite make it happen. But we are talking all the time about it and we really want to make something happen. I think it would be a lot of fun. Nick's channel, by the way, for those of you watching this who don't know it, who's probably exactly nobody, you probably all know it, um, is absolutely going through the roof. Uh, he got over 150,000 subscribers now. He's a great guy. Love what he's doing. I love the fact it's sufficiently different from me for us both to have our respective spaces in the industry. Um, and between, you know, Nick and myself and uh, Tristan at Super Yacht Captain, Jared, Watney, uh, Dennis and Yacht Sales as well. I think there's some great content now, yacht content on, on YouTube. Um, <laughs> I own Penna says, I see you met Mike Tyson. Uh, yeah, I feel like it. The day after the operation, I felt like I did. I can tell you that. Um, I'm just working my way back up the questions so that I don't miss anybody. Um, Javier Costa Henere, as a bro who, by the way, I think has been on every single live stream. So thanks, Javier. As a broker, does it happen that you go on a business trip of several days to show different yachts to different people? Or you, do you just go one by one? Um, obviously, when you make a business trip, you try to make the most of it. It's very unusual. It's, it's very unusual that you'll go and meet more than one client on one trip. But certainly you try to show one client as many yachts as you can on that trip. And um, usually in my case, uh, if I'm showing a yacht to a client, if it's in the south of France, I take the opportunity to catch up with my colleagues in the south of France. If it's in Turkey, then there are yacht builders in Turkey that I want to go and see. If it's on the coast of Italy, I'll try to make the most to go and see yacht builders. So you, you, we try to make the most of it, but um, showing different yachts to different people is unusual uh, for that to happen, to tell you the truth. The Hammer Dag says, hi, David, how do you avoid being cut out of a deal when the buyer manages to get in touch with the seller? Um, the first thing you have to do, and this is maybe, I'm making note of this, another thing that we should talk about in a live stream. The central, let's do this next week. This is what next week's live stream is going to be about, the central agency agreements. It's a legal contract between you and the seller that you will market the yacht and, and do various other things. You'll handle the sale, but they will pay you a commission. And it's legally binding. Um, you know, you, again, it's something we're going to do in detail maybe in next week. You know, you try to make sure it's legally binding in a court of law in a place like the UK, where the law moves a little bit quicker than, say, in other countries that I won't mention, <laughs> Italy. Um, so you do try to, um, you know, at least have a contract before you start to do business. Having said that, there are times when you know buyers and sellers do get together and they try to cut the broker out sometimes they manage it it's business you just have to take it on the chin sometime although certainly one of the advantages of working for a large brokerage company like northrop and johnson is that we absolutely do litigate and we do go for it for it we, we take legal action if that has happened to, happen to us and then, you know on occasion it has happened we've won the case um so yeah, that's that's the answer to that uh, to that question, really. Um, if you don't have a central agency agreement, of course, you leave yourself open to that happening. It's business. Business relies upon good, solid, cast iron, watertight contracts. Kashmir, I like your name. Hey, David, love the channel. Thank you, Kashmir. Just a fun question. If you had three million pounds to spend on a yacht, including the price of yearly maintenance, would you go with a traditional yacht or a solo yacht? Ah, good question. I presume when you say including the price of yearly maintenance, you mean for one year. Since I am filming Silent Not Yachts next week, I hope, I'm gonna say solar yachts. And also, because I do love silent yachts they are a fantastic product i love it they're very much of the moment so silent yachts 
David, another super chat. Thank you very much, uh, David Dillon. I really appreciate all these super chats very, very much indeed. You asked the question, when it comes to yachting manufacturers, I know big names like Lurson, San Lurson, I think you mean San Lorenzo, etc. And sorry if I killed the spelling. You did kill the spelling, David, but we'll forgive you since it was a super chat. <laughs> Lurson, San Lorenzo. But are there any builders that you think don't get a fair shake because they're not well known? Um, yeah, absolutely there are. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff goes on in yachting. And I think a lot of brands which are very, very well known don't necessarily have the quality of yachts, yacht builders that are not so well known. And it's all a question of marketing. It really is all a question of marketing. Some yacht builders put phenomenal amounts into their marketing to have an incredible presence and you know, yachts which just blow the owner away, but are maybe not put together that well. And I wouldn't go as far as to say they're not seaworthy. You know, there, there are yachts out there which you can have a lot of fun with in calm weather in the south of France or in the Bahamas. And, you know, if that's what you're looking for, that's absolutely great. But there are definitely yacht builders out there that build better quality for a better price, but they're not putting their money into marketing. Um, I'm trying to think of an example for you. Um, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of SARP yachts. Uh, they've only built one yacht, but they did a very, very good job of it. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Bilgin, who built quite a few yachts and whose quality has just gone from strength to strength to strength and currently have three 80 metre yachts in construction, all sold. Um, and their price quality ratio is really quite excellent. Um, but they're marketing. And, and actually, I, I, I would, it's not fair to say that the sales and marketing director is a friend of mine, but we have a nice, friendly, positive relationship. And um, I'm sure he would love to have more budget for the marketing because he's a, he's a very, very clever guy and I'm sure he'd know what to do with it. But there are, maybe that's one of the reasons, one of the values that a broker can bring is that knowledge of the market that you don't, you know, Ferretti are great, San Lorenzo, Sunseeker, the big names are great, but it's good as well to look beyond them and to look at some of the smaller builders too, as long as you know what the pros and cons are um, of those brands. Stevins Otro, another um, another super chat from you. Thank you very much indeed, Stevins. If I sneeze in a moment, you'll have to excuse me. As you can imagine, this bandage on the edge of my nose is um, is very irritating. Excuse me. <coughs> yeah. Excuse me for that. I'm waiting for all the bless you comments now to come down in the comment section. Stevens, you say, I love watching your videos, David. Thank you, Stevens. Um, can a yacht worth five million or less cross the Atlantic? Forgive my, forgive your English. Your English is perfect. Um, yeah, absolutely. A yacht worth five million or less can cross the Atlantic. Um, trying to think of some good examples. I mean, obviously a sailing boat. Uh, there are lots of people who have sailing yachts worth considerably less than five million that cross the Atlantic. But um, if you look back through my videos, um, actually Illusion was a little bit over five million, but I, I didn't do a video of it, but I did do a, uh, I did sell a yacht called Mary Jean, uh, which was a sub five million um, Euro yacht. Uh, and that crossed the Atlantic many, many times. So yes, I mean, you can buy a, a, an older steel and aluminium vessel for less than five million. Uh, the running costs will be quite high, of course, but it's absolutely possible to, to cross the Atlantic. Um, I'm just making sure I didn't miss another super chat here. Oh, no, it was yours, David's, that just seemed to come across my, my little feed there more than once. Uh, again, if I'm missing any super chats, please let me know because I'm technically challenged and don't always pick up on them. Uh, Svetlin Karazov, what got you into yacht brokerage? Good question. Are there any particular differences in getting clients for sellers and clients as buyers? Yeah, very much differences. Um, when you want to get a client who's a seller, you have to pitch for that. Um, and you have to have a certain skill set, which is what I, where I believe my skill set lies um, in 
promoting yachts which is for sale um you don't really pitch to to represent a buyer so much that's more about having a relationship with the buyer where he trusts you and you've, you've cultivated that relationship over time uh, we have another super chats kevin thank you very much you haven't put a question with that kevin so thank you very much indeed i really appreciate that if you have a question put it in the comments below i'll be happy to answer it as thoroughly as i possibly can javier costa hendler quite rightly says um nordhaven have plenty of one million dollar yachts or so that can cross the atlantic um yeah i mean i've got to be honest that's absolutely true um yeah it's absolutely true what can i say <laughs> you're absolutely right Michael Berger, thank you very much for your super chats. Um, with a, you're giving me not just a super chat, but also a suggestion. Thank you. Compare buyer and seller brokerage. I'm going to write that down. That is a very good idea. Compare buyer and seller. Great idea for a future live stream. Kevin, why are there so many, why are there so few burger yachts? especially the larger ones that come up for sale are they too expensive being overbuilt or just not well enough exposed you know my personal opinion of that is that there you have an example of um, a yacht builder whose marketing is just not bringing them my goodness i hope their marketing director doesn't hear this <laughs> but um they've, they've never They've never been exactly ahead of the pack in, in marketing. And the very few burger yachts that I've seen, I like very much. And I have absolutely nothing negative to say about their quality or their price. But they're not great at marketing. Um, they're really not. And, um, you know, maybe that's the reason that you don't see as many burgers on the seas as you could otherwise. Or, or to be fair, actually, to be fair to burger, some business owners prefer it that way they prefer to build a limited amount of yachts to have somewhat of a, a waiting list for buyers and not to grow the company any more than that and you can do that in the yachting industry you can just have your regular buyers who appreciate your product are willing to wait for it and you do a yacht a year two yachts a year um so that could easily be the case with burger too Darshan, let me just check these. No, great. Uh, Darshan Srinivasa, why don't you do catamarans? I do do catamarans. I've done a vlog about uh, silent yachts. I've done a vlog about Sun Reef. I'm following the construction of the Silent 80. I don't do many catamarans, but that's because it's not a huge market and my speciality is more motor yachts. Um, and what happened? Darshan, you must have just arrived. And what happened to your nose? <laughs> it was an operation on my nose to have a, it's called a basal cell carcinoma, which had to be removed. And uh, unfortunately, this is where I'm going to look for a couple of weeks, although I hope they replace the bandage with a more stylish uh, plaster at some point. Mirko H says, hi, David, hope you're well. If the owner of Dilbar calls you tomorrow to sell his yacht, how much will you charge him? And would you retire after that? <laughs> Mirko, yeah, I've got to tell you the truth. If the owner of Dilbar called me to sell his yacht, um, I wouldn't take it. That is, I would take it, but I would um, do a deal with Northrop and Johnson where I did the video, but another probably two to three yacht brokers had to take the responsibility of the sale. The reason I say that is because it is such a large yacht. It is so difficult to sell. You could spend the next three years of your life um working on getting that yacht sold and it consumes all of the business that you do and then you don't sell it and it gets given to another broker it is an extremely high risk for a yacht broker to take on um a yacht like that it would bring huge prestige to whatever brokerage company gets it for sale but i'm in this for business and um it's not a yacht that i personally would want to dedicate that much time to having said that of course Northrop and Johnson will be delighted to have that listing and they put their top people on it and we do have brokers in the company who are very very capable of selling a yacht uh, of that magnitude 
added to that, um, I can honestly say that if I did a video of it, it would probably be more watched than, you know, than any other broker could probably offer to to the uh, to the owner. Just saying that in case the owner happens to be watching, you just never know these days, do you? I'm going to take another couple of questions and then I'm going to have to call it a day, I'm afraid, uh, where I have a cold beer waiting for me in the fridge. I actually found these live streams. I love doing them. I get a real buzz from doing them. I uh, hope you're enjoying them too. And afterwards, I'm craving for a cold beer and it's just a nice way to end a Friday evening. Oh, we've had a, another um, live stream. Jesse Poor. Thank you, Jesse. Hi, David. I'm from the Netherlands. Love to watch your channel. What do you think about the Dutch builders and what is your favourite shipyard? Um, I think Dutch builders are absolutely amazing. Highest quality, amongst the highest quality in the world. Um, there are so many great shipyards there. I'm not going to say who my favourite is simply because I don't really have one. I mean, Fedship is is the name, isn't it? I mean, Fedship is just the, in my opinion, the most prestigious name in the industry. I mean, it's an amazing, 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 amazing shipyard. But Heeson is a real kick-ass builder too, and I love their new projects they're coming out with, and they are lovely people to you know to work with and to communicate with. Icon, as you know, I have a great relationship with. They've just, um, oh, by the way, they've just launched Ragnar, which as you may know, I've been doing a video documentary of, and we're in discussions to film the final, uh, the, the final video of Ragnar. So um, watch this space. Nothing's set in stone yet, but it's looking pretty good. Um, so I, anybody who's got bad things to say about Dutch yacht builders, doesn't know anything about yachts because they are the creme de la creme and i'm not just saying that because you're from the netherlands i suspect jesse that you already know that that's the case but um you know apart from uh the 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 ones that i've just mentioned the 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 little builders like uh i know he pronounces it waka and waka w-a-j-e-r great guys lovely products um it's a wonderful guy i don't just love the yacht builders i love the country it's a wonderful country and an example to many other countries in the world how about that jesse you live in a great place i'm going to do one more question and then um <laughs> kevin that's so funny kevin says kevin aylwood says um david that buzz is likely not from the video but from the cocaine that they packed up your nose with at the hospital <laughs> No, I can guarantee you this is just bandage. And let me tell you, it is swollen and throbbing under there as well. Stevens, another super chat. Thank you very much, Stevens. I really do appreciate this. Um, David, around how much money would it be the cost on a yacht like Solo? I always hear is 10% of the price of the yacht. 10% is a very broad rule of thumb. Uh, in the case of Solo, I I actually don't know the running costs of Solo. And because it's one of our central agency yachts, I don't want to give any bad information out there. What I can tell you is that it's so popular on the charter market, it pretty much covers its running costs from um, the charter that it does, which is really quite exceptional. And strangely enough, as you go up to those larger yachts, a lot of them seem to come close to running their um, their running costs from charter revenue. It's really quite a remarkable thing. I mean, if I had to throw a figure at it, I would think that a, a yacht like Solo is, is running on four to five million a year. But that is just my educated guess. That is all that is. I don't have any inside information on that. Svetlin, thank you very much as well for your super chat. Um, you ask a very good question. What influences the discount on the listing price? And is there some general expectation from clients? Svetlin, um, what influences the discount on the listing price uh, is very often how long the yacht's been on the market. If it's been on the market for a year and it's still not sold, 
the market is telling you something. And um, it may be that the market is telling you that the asking price is too high. So that can influence the discounts um, on actually discounting the asking price and reducing the asking price. Um, a lot depends upon the owner. I, my my clients, we never ask a price that's too far from what the owner is prepared to accept. Um, having said that, expectations from clients, almost without exception, clients have, buyers have crazy expectations, crazy expectations. And it's a risky business, Svetling, to be honest, because, um, you know, if, for example, I have a yacht for sale that's five million, but I know that the owner will take let's say 4.3, 4.4, and um, a client comes in and offers 3.9. We're not so far apart that we can't find an agreement. But what tends to happen is buyers come in and they offer two, or they offer 2.2 on a yacht that we're asking five. And even worse still, you get these smart aleck brokers, sorry to say it, but it's the truth, who then try to convince you that that's all the boat's worth. And because now we've got COVID, who do you think is going to buy it? And if you don't take my buyer's offer now, you're going to be left with it in a year. What will it be worth? And all of this stuff you hear time and time and time again. They're just trying to bully you and push you down. Um, and the, the problem is with buyers like that who come in with very low offers is that they... I, as a broker, have an obligation, a contractual obligation to put that offer forward to the seller. And the seller can get so offended that he won't even open a dialogue. He never wants to hear from that person again because he's just grossly offended by such a low offer. So from a brokerage perspective, um, although I understand buyers coming in trying to get the best deal they can, it's very counterproductive because it just... You know, it doesn't even open a, a negotiation. You, you know, the, the buyers really need to come in at a realistic price. And sellers, of course, have to be led by their broker to ask a realistic uh, asking price. With that, I'm going to close the live stream. I thank you all so much for putting up with this appearance. I'm afraid uh, it's going to be this way for two to three weeks. Um, hopefully the scar afterwards will... Uh, not be too unsightly. I had a little peak in the mirror and actually it's very, very, it's long, but small. It's long because my nose is long. Nothing can be done about that. Uh, but thank you once again for the super chats. Thanks very much for tuning in. Um, and next week we'll have another live chat discussing brokerage uh, items, specifically talking about the central agency contract on a yacht. Thank you once again and have a very good weekend.